Night Beat. Hi, this is Randy Stone. I cover the Night Beat for the Chicago Star. Stories start in many different ways. This one began on an elevated train and ended in eternity. Night Beat, starring Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. The night is just about washed up. The sky is getting that tattletale gray around the edges. Another hour or so, three million alarm clocks will start yakking against the eardrums of Chicago's dear hearts and gentle people. And a goodly number of said dear hearts and gentle people will stumble to the front door for their copy of the Morning Star. I'm wondering what they'll say when they read the opening sentence of the Night Beat story for today. The line that goes... This is a love story with the happiest ending I've ever heard. I guess they'll figure spring has got me in its perfume clutches, and more than likely I'll wind up around a bologna sandwich, and that'll be that. Only if they just keep reading, maybe they'll be in for a strange kind of surprise. It started a little after 10 o'clock last night. I just boarded an elevated train was on my way to the loop. The train was pretty crowded, but I saw an empty seat up front, and I hurried for it. I started sitting down without looking. Anton, where have you been? Hmm? I beg your pardon? Oh, I've waited so long, Anton. The girl sitting next to me. I noticed her for the first time. About 20, maybe. And so beautiful, so delicately beautiful, it was like your eyes had hit the jackpot, and somehow the... The grinding elevator train suddenly sounded like a gypsy violin. Oh, Anton, you shouldn't have gone away. Look, I I hate to tell you this, but I think you've got me mixed up. Oh, it's so good to hear you, to be near you, Anton, so good. Yeah, it's good to be near you too, kid. Won't, won't, won't ever go away again, will you? (laughs) I'd like to stay here forever. Promise me, Anton. Promise me you'll never go away. Beautiful as she was, it started giving me the creeps. If I'd been Anton, I'd have enjoyed it immensely, but being as how I was two other guys, I didn't see it. And also, there was something about her eyes, a disturbing brightness. I didn't know what to do about it, and before I could decide... Lake Street Transfer. I reached my transfer station. I started getting up. Anton, no, don't go. Oh, lady, look, it's my station. Don't leave me again, Anton, please, no. Now, now take it easy. Let go of me. What's wrong with you? This is my station. Anton... I can't let you leave me again. I won't. Well, you'll just have to, kid, and I'll let go my no. sleeve, huh? Oh. No. She folded up like a little rag doll into a dead faint. I bent over her, picked up her arm to massage her wrist. It was like touching a hot stove. She was burning up with fever. Passengers in the car were crowding around. The conductor still hadn't given the signal for the train to leave the station. I picked the girl up in my arms, who was like lifting a ten-year-old kid. She must have weighed a fast 90 pounds. I carried her out of the train onto the platform. Someone called for an ambulance. She was still unconscious when the ambulance came. She looked so small and so lost and so alone. And, well, according to her, I was Anton, so the least Anton could do would be to sit beside her on the long ride to the hospital. She was still out cold when we reached County Hospital. They found her name and address inside her purse. Mrs. Marisha Nowak, 612 Larrabee Street. I waited around to see what was wrong with her. After almost an hour, they said I could go upstairs and talk to the doctor. Oh, Mr. Stone? Oh, yes. Doctor, I, w- I want to see about that girl I brought in, Marisha Nowak. Yes. A relative of yours? Oh, no, no. I just met her tonight. Oh, I'm afraid we've got to contact some relative right away. Nothing you can do for her, huh? Do for her? Poor kid's been sick for years and waits till she's dying before she comes to a hospital. Well, it takes money to go to a hospital, Doc. Not here. Why didn't she come here? What's wrong with these people? Are they proud or stupid? Three years ago, maybe we could have done something for her, but now... 
Well, yeah. I'll... I don't know, Mr. Stone. I don't know. It's, it's completely frustrating. You study medicine, what good does it do? Sometimes life doesn't seem to make any sense. Since when is it supposed to make sense? Uh, I sound like this is my first patient. Not very professional, I'm afraid. <laughs> but don't worry about it. It's human. Now, this girl keeps talking about her husband, Anton. Well, she was talking that way when I met her. Yes, he's supposed to take her away someplace to Mexico. She says where it's warm and she'll get well. What do they expect? Miracles? Oh, sure, miracles. Maybe Mexico was going to be her miracle. Do you have any idea how to contact her husband? But, but doesn't the girl know where he is? Doesn't seem to, even when she's not delirious. Got an address from her purse, a place... Over on Larrabee Street, north of Chicago Avenue. Yes, I know that neighborhood. Furnished rooms with kitchen privileges. Bring your own mousetraps. Lovely. No phone listing. I was thinking of calling the police. Yeah. Trouble is, there's so little time. Well, how much time? I don't know. Could happen five minutes from now. Five hours. Well, uh... Tell you what, I'll drop by her address and see what I can find out. Doctor, she's conscious again. Rational, she wants to talk to you. All right, nurse. Uh... Care to see you, Mr. Stone? Yeah. The doc turned and walked into the room, and I... Well, I followed him. That's a nice promising beginning for a love story with a happy ending, hmm? Only when we got inside Mauritian Noack's room, the joke was on me. There was no hearts and flowers. She was even more beautiful than before. Her black hair spread out on the white pillow, her delicate face and the lovely eyes following us as we came into the room. No fear in those eyes. None at all. Just a sort of questioning. Doctor, have you found him yet? Not yet, Marisha. We're still trying. This is Mr. Stone. He's trying to help us locate your husband. Oh, I hope you find him. Poor Anton. He'll feel so bad if you don't find him in time. Well, of course he will. That's why the doctor'd like you to tell me anything you can that might help us find him. But I told the doctor he went to find work, my Anton. So he could take me away where I could get well and could be a wife to him. Does it bother you to talk? Does it tire you? No. No, I like talking about him. And there's so little time. Doctor said you were planning on going to Mexico. To Las Flores. The little town of the flowers in Veracruz. My ring is from Mexico. See? Silver and turquoise. It's nice. We were married with two rings. Exactly alike. Silver and turquoise. You think Anton could have gone there, to Mexico? No. No, he'd never have gone there without me. The little town of the flowers. Like we planned on our honeymoon. Just like it said in the travel folder. With thousands of blossoms on the water. Perfuming the air. But we went to a real hotel here in Chicago on our honeymoon. Anton insisted on it. Even though we couldn't afford it. It was in the winter, and it was cold in Chicago, like now. Icicles hung from the trees, breaking the branches. But in the room, it was warm. And we had each other. Look out the window, Mauricia. You know, I've I've never seen the lake from up high. Isn't it beautiful? Oh, Anton. I'm so happy, Anton. But... Wasn't it extravagant coming here to a hotel? I'd have been just as satisfied going straight to our room. On Larrabee Street? Nah, Marisha, not on our honeymoon. We'll have time enough for that. How could you possibly imagine anything beautiful from a furnished room on Larrabee Street? Darling. But here, this is different. It's more than a hotel room in Chicago overlooking the lake. This is what we've dreamed of. Imagine it's Las Flores. Yes. The little town of the flowers. Look out there, Marisha. That isn't snow. It's thick tropical foliage. And those aren't icicles hanging from the trees. They're blossoms. And the wind is warm and soft outside. Oh, you'll get well, Marisha. We don't need money. We can live for practically nothing. Fresh fruit growing on trees. All we can eat. Oh, we will go there, Anton. We will. And I'll get well there. I'll be a wife to you, Anton. Just you wait and see. We didn't go to Mexico. And then Anton went away. And you haven't heard from him since? No. But I don't blame him. Why should a man stay with a wife who's sick? Oh, no, no, no. You 
You said yourself you went away to earn money for your trip. Yes. Yes, that's it. But now if I could only see him once more, just once, to tell him not to feel badly, to be happy for what we had, if I could only tell him not to feel sorry, because it was the same as if we really had been to us, Flory. Well, you better rest now. I'll... I'll try to find him. It's tough when they know they're going to die. It's not that they're scared. But suddenly there's something they feel they've got to do when time is running out. That's how it was with Marisha Noick. She had to find her Anton to tell him it was okay about a little town in Mexico that neither one of them had ever seen or ever would see. How do you find a guy like that and what was I doing looking for him? Oh, well. I took a cab back to the loop. I picked up my car and drove over to the Larrabee Street address. It was a rooming house, all right, and the poorest-looking one on the block. I rang the bell and I waited. A middle-aged woman came to the door. What is it? Are you the manager? If you're looking for a room, I got no vacancy. Oh, no, no, I don't want a room. You have someone living here by the name of Noack. Yes, but she ain't home. She ain't been here all day. I know that. Uh, she's in the hospital. The hospital? Oh, the poor thing. I was worried about her. She's never been out late like this. Is her husband here, Anton Noack? Oh, I know. He ain't been here for a long time. Working someplace out of the city, I think. Well, do you have any idea where? I've got to find him. Mrs. Noack is... Well, they don't expect her to live. He's got to be notified. Oh, no. Oh, that poor little girl. For such a long time, she's been sick. Come on in, please. Maybe there's something in here written down. Or maybe Mr. Nowak's brother would know. His brother? Where does he live? Well, no, I don't know exactly. He's the one that's been sending Mrs. Nowak money to live on while her husband's been away. That was a beginning. We found an envelope from the brother in the girl's room, Paul Nowak. He lived on Clark Street in the Lincoln Park neighborhood. I drove over. There was a man coming down the steps as I got out of my car. I stopped him when he got to the sidewalk. I beg your pardon? Yes? I saw you coming out of that building. You wouldn't be Paul Nowak, would you? Why do you ask? Well, I'm from the Chicago Star. I'm trying to locate Anton Nowak. Well, I can't help you. I, I don't know anything about him. Excuse me, I'm late to work. Mr. Nowak! Huh. You are his brother, aren't you? Oh, yes, but Well, I... what's the matter with you? I, I don't know anything about him. He's He's gone away someplace to work. Look, fellow, I gotta find her. Marisha's very sick. Marisha? She's in the hospital. Oh, I, I didn't know. I gotta find your brother right away. I told you I don't know where he is. My brother and I Well, we don't see each other. I haven't seen him since he left. But he's written to you. He must have. You've been sending money to his wife. All right. It's none of your business, but I'll tell you. I had one letter from him. He asked me to do what I could for Marisha until he could send for her. Where was the letter from? Say where he was working? Some place in uh, Montreal. He, he didn't give any address. Uh, some uh, fur company, like uh, Chicago Montreal Furs. Well, it doesn't sound like you're telling me the truth, Mr. Noack, but I can't see why you'd want a thing like that on your conscience. I'm telling you the truth. Well, okay, but don't take it so hard. Oh, Marisha. That poor kid. Uh, I'll see you the first thing tomorrow. Well, you better make it tonight. I can't. I just can't. We're right in the middle of our tax work. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I, I see your point. Only thing is that uh, tomorrow she'll be dead. That's not true. The do doctors are notorious for saying things like that. I I, I don't believe it for a uh, minute. Would you believe it if you weren't in the middle of your tax work, Mr. Norton? Now, you have no right to talk to me like that. No right at all. No, I'll not. see you tomorrow, I tell you. I'll see you tomorrow. I'll... You get out of my way. Get out of my way and, and, and stay out of my life. Stay out of my life or you'll regret it, Mr. Stone. Now, what was that for? A love story with a happy ending. Yes, that's what the man said. Only right at the moment, if there was any happiness in the world, it was staying out of my sight. Almost midnight, and Marisha Noack up at the hospital, hanging on to life by her fingernails until I could find her husband, Anton. Nothing to go on but the name Anton's brother had thrown at me, the Chicago Montreal Fur Company. I looked it up in the phone book. It was there, all right. I started dialing the number. 
I didn't imagine anybody be around this time of the night, but it was the only lead I had at the moment. There weren't too many moments left. All I could think about was what the doctor had said. Maybe she's got five hours. Five hours. No, nobody's going to answer. Hello? Hello. Uh, this is a reporter on the Chicago Star. Oh, there's nobody here. All gone home. Uh, look, I'm trying to locate a man who's working for your company. There's nobody here. I'm a cleaning woman. Uh, call tomorrow. No, no, no. No, wait, please. Listen, I don't have any time. This is very important. Can you tell me how I can locate the manager of your company? The manager gone home at 5 o'clock. Uh, this is the cleaning woman. Oh, yes, yes, I understand that. But can you please tell me the manager's number? I've got to telephone him now. Oh, just a minute. I waited. Seemed like forever while she went for the number. Hello? Yeah, were you able to find it? Uh, George Swanson. Lakeview 42311. Lakeview 42311. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, tell him I didn't give out the number only because it's an emergency. Yes, all right. I'll tell him. Thank you. Goodbye. L.A. 4... Three, one, one. Uh, hello. hello, Mr. Swanson. Yes? I'm sorry to trouble you, Mr. Swanson, but it's very important. My name is Stone. I'm a reporter on the Star. I'm trying to locate a man who works for your company, an Anton Nowak. Uh, 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 we have no one by that name working for what? us. Uh, what, what was that name? Anton Nowak. Never have had since I've been with the company. Of course, we're an old firm. May have been away back. Oh, no. No, no. This would have been in the last year or so. No, sorry. Uh, would you have any way of knowing if he worked at your Montreal branch? We have no Montreal branch. Isn't your company the Chicago Montreal Fur Company? Yeah, that's right. We haven't had a branch in Montreal for years. That used to be our headquarters when the company first started, but we're strictly a Chicago firm now. Oh, I see. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry to trouble you. Oh, not at all. Oh, uh, if it's going to be printed in the papers, don't forget to mention our name. No, no, I won't. Goodbye, Mr. Swanson. Something was beginning to smell, and it wasn't just the west wind out of the stockyards. I checked the vital statistics on deaths. No Anton Nowak since 44. Checked the police records for amnesia cases. In the central bonding company files, Paul Nowak was listed as a night auditor with the Great Lakes Bank Reserve over on State Street. I drove around to State Street and rang the night bell at the Great Lakes Reserve. The watchman wouldn't let me in, but in a couple of minutes, Nowak came out of the building alone. His face was white as he came toward me. Why did you come here? Well, your brother doesn't work for the Chicago Montreal Fur Company. I thought you'd want to know. No, I don't want to know. I don't want to know anything about him. Your own brother? You had no right to come here. No right, do you hear? This is my work. Well, sure, but I didn't think you'd mind. After all, you've got nothing to hide. Of course I have nothing to hide. They know me here. I'm, I'm respected. I have a position of trust. You, you have no right to come here and make trouble for me. It's taken me years to get where I am. All right, now, just take it easy. Nobody's interested in making trouble for you. But I am interested in finding Anton Nowak, and whether you like it or not, that's what I intend to do. Well, then find him. Find him, only stay away from me. Stay away from my work. I can't help you. I've told you that. Now stay away from me. I didn't have time to twist his arm. As a last resort, I headed across town to police headquarters, Bureau of Missing Persons, and my old friend, Sergeant Adams. No, Randy, no, he's never been listed as a missing person. Somebody would have had to report him, his wife or a brother, you know, for us to have a record on him. Yes, yes, Adams, I know that, but the guy is missing. You say you checked the death records. That's right. How about hospital records? Well, there's nothing to go on and not enough time, Adams. I tell you, I've got to find the fellow tonight, tomorrow, the latest. Yeah, yeah, date of disappearance, May 10th, 1948. Did you check the arrest records for that date? Nothing under no Uh-huh, how about John Doe's? John Doe's? No, I never thought of that. Yeah, well, come on, it won't take much time. Never can tell. Yeah, just might be something. Usually you find something on these John Doe's after you had them a while. FBI prints, pictures, or else they just break down, tell us who they are. Of course, if they're just John Doe drunks, <laughs> just a matter of sobering them up. Uh-huh. Right in here, Randy. Hi, Mac. Hello, Adams. Arrest records, 48 May 10th. Okay. You better make it May 11th, too. Uh, you the guy that phoned earlier? Yes, I phoned. Nothing under those names you asked about. Yeah, Mac, yeah, we want to have a look at the John Doe's. Yeah. Here you are. Yeah. May 10th. A's, B's, C's, D. Day. Dalton, Denver, Dill, 
Doe. Doe. John Doe drunk. John Doe drunk. John Doe drunk. Must have been kind of drunk out there. Uh, here's one. John Doe armed robbery. Let me see the file on this one, Mac. 192701. Right. You think there'd be any information in the file? Uh, you never can tell, Randy. Personal property slip sometimes has the information you can use. Here you are. 192701. Mm. John Doe, age 23. Hair, dark eyes, brown. Height 5, 10, 3 quarters. No identifying scars. Well, that, uh, you know, that, mm. that age that age is right. It, it could be no What did he do? Um, hold up. Hmm. Captured by the victim. Must have been new at the game. Let's look at what else you got, huh? Yeah, we'll have a look at the personal property list. Stuff he had on him when he was booked. Ah. Brown suit, white shirt, blue striped tie. No hat, white handkerchief. What is this under jewelry? One only hand ring Indian. Silver and turquoise. What else? Cash, eight cents. Identification? No, no. That's about all. It... Oh, here's a note. <laughs> I guess he was trying to get away. One only travel folder on Mexico. I'd found him. Anton Nowak was John Doe, arrested for robbery May 10th, 1948, convicted and sentenced to Joliet for two to five years, still under the name of John Doe. It was beginning to fit together, sure. He didn't want her to know. That's why he hadn't written. That was the reason for the lie about the job in Montreal. He was afraid it would hurt her. And the prison record, that's why his brother wouldn't tell where he was, afraid that somehow Anton's crime would reflect on his own bank job. I jumped into my car and headed out Ogden Avenue towards Joliet over 30 miles away. It was the middle of the night. I had no idea what I could do when I got there. All I knew was I had to get there fast. Maybe he'd been released. Maybe I could talk the warden into letting him out with me under guard. Maybe I could put a call through to the hospital. He could at least talk to her on the phone. I didn't know. When I got to Joliet, the place was lit up like soldiers feel. The guard took me inside to the warden. He was dressed. He seemed to have been expecting me. Now, you're a little late, Stone. Doesn't anybody go to bed around here? Yeah, the rest of the boys have been and gone. The rest of what boys? The other papers. You mean they got here ahead of me? Yeah, why, of course. The break happened a couple of hours ago. A break? I thought there was something funny about all those lights and everybody being up at this time of the night. Isn't that why you're here? No, no, I came up to see a fellow. What happened? One of the men suddenly decided he wanted out. Grabbed a gun away from a guard and started blasting away. Had to shoot him to stop him. Not an organized break? No, he was alone. Can't understand it. Model prisoner. Coming up for parole in a month. And tonight he just blows up. Poor fellow. Uh, his name wouldn't be John Doe, would it? One of many. How did you know? Well, he might be the fellow who's coming up to see. Chicago number 192701. Yeah. Uh, so that's a shame. He's in a hospital cell down the hall. I see him. Pretty bad off. I'd like to see him, if you don't mind, Warden. Come on. Thank you. Funny about these John Doe's. <coughs> Did you know him? No, no, I don't. I, I think I know his wife. Usually something pretty decent about them. Trying to protect their families, mostly. Can't hardly blame them, either. Oh, uh... Hello, Warden. A doctor, this is Mr. Stone. Mm -hmm. One of the Chicago papers. All right if we go in and talk to him for a minute? Well, I'm afraid it won't make much difference, Warden. Go ahead, Stone. Thank you. Hello, fella. Hi. I don't want to bother you, but I I came up here tonight looking for a fellow named Anton Nowak. My name's John Doe. Yeah, this, uh, this Anton Nowak, I never met him, but from what I hear, he's quite a guy. I wouldn't know. I had it from a girl named Marisha, his wife, I believe. She loved him quite a lot. By the way, that ring you were wearing, where'd you get that? I stole it. Really? Why would anyone steal a cheap little bit of silver and turquoise? I happen to like it. Uh-huh. I saw one like that on a girl once. Uh, it was a wedding ring. The girl liked it, too. This fellow Noack gave it to her, but then he got into some sort of a jam. He had to go away for a while. He didn't tell her anything about what happened. He was afraid it might have hurt her. Would have killed her? No. Would have made her unhappy, maybe. But she would have understood. She loved him an awful lot. She would have been glad he was squaring things up. She, um, she loved him an awful lot. What do you want, mister? Well, like I said, I was just looking for a fella. Uh, just one question for the paper. I'm sorry I have to ask you, but 
How did you happen to pick tonight to break out? Why didn't you wait for your release? I don't know. Something made me. Something kept telling me she needed me. Doctor, quick. Marisha. Flowers on the water. How beautiful in the sunlight. He's gone. Instinctively, I looked down at my watch. 2.35 in the morning. A nice lonely time to make your curtain call. 2.35 a.m. Fine little night I've been having. I really felt low. I telephoned the story into the paper and went back to the hospital. I wasn't going to be much help to Marisha Nowak, but I promised to come back. The doctor was in the hall working over some reports at the night desk. He looked up when I stepped out of the elevator. Hello, Mr. Stone. Hello, Doc. I found our Anton all right. Hmm? A little too late, though. Uh, dead. Really? Wouldn't have made any difference. She, uh... Yeah? I'm making out the report now. Not oh, great. Wasn't so bad, Stone. Wasn't bad at all. She was happy. I've never seen anyone so happy. What did she have to be happy about? Oh, who knows? But right at the last, this... this wonderful smile came across her face. I guess it was delirium. She kept saying something like flowers on the water. How beautiful in the sunlight? Yes, that's what she said. How how, how did... That report that you're making out, Doc, tell me. What was the time of death? Hmm? Tell me, Doc, please. Oh, it's, uh, 2.35 a.m. Why? 2.35 a.m. Yeah. So here I sit, watching the dawn creeping up on Chicago, tapping out 30 to my story for tonight. A love story, no less. A very pessimistic fellow once wrote, When two people really love each other, there can never be a happy ending. Well, it could be. But then again, maybe that pessimistic fellow used one word too many. Maybe when two people really love each other, there can never be an ending. Oh, who knows? You pays your money, and it takes your choice. Copy, boy. Night Beat, a new dramatic series stars Frank Lovejoy as Randy Stone. Night Beat is edited by Larry Mason, directed by Warren Lewis. Music is by Frank Worth. Others in tonight's cast were Joyce McCluskey, Vic Perrin, Jack Edwards, Jerry Hosner, Rena Craig, Larry Dobkin, and Charles Seal. Frank Lovejoy will next be seen in Milton Sperling's production, Rock Bottom, released by Warner Brothers. Listen next week at this same time and every week as Randy Stone searches through the city for the strange stories waiting for him in the darkness. The stories that come out of the shadows to find their way into Night Beat. 